Welcome to worship here at FPCA, where we are transforming life by glorifying God, following Jesus, and loving our neighbor. This is our worship service for Sunday, July 4th, 2021. I am Adrian Rodriguez, and I want to give a special thank you to the Reverend Jim Withrow for bringing today's message. And thanks for all of you who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. Please be sure to like and subscribe and even leave a comment down below. If you are not on our email list, please send a message to Kim at firstprestexas.org so you are up to date with all that is happening here at FPCA. We will celebrate communion today, so go ahead and have some bread and juice or whatever works best for your household for later in the service. And we will have an offering time in the service. You can also bring uh, or send your gifts by sending checks in the mail, setting up automated drafts through your bank, or directly on our website, firstpresstexas.org, or through our church app, which you can install on your phone or your device. Lastly, the church office will be closed on Monday, July 5th. At this time, I would like to share this prayer on this special day. Please pray with me. God, source of all freedom, this day is bright with the memory of those who declared that life and liberty are your gift to every human being. Help us to continue a good work begun long ago. Make our vision clear and our will strong that only in human solidarity we will find liberty and justice only in the honor that belongs to every life on earth. Turn our hearts towards the family of nations to understand that the ways of others, to offer friendship, and to find safety only in the common good of all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, please join me in the call to worship that is, print, that is displayed on your screen. The Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship God. We and our ancestors have sinned. Our ancestors exchanged the glory of God for the image of a golden calf. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt. While our means are different, our compulsions are the same. Let us confess our brokenness for God in merciful and just and will forgive us our sins. Let us pray first silently, then together using the prayer displayed on your screen. Now, Lord, hear us as we pray together. Holy God, you are the Lord, our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and yet our trust in you is fragile, easily crushed by our bent towards indifference, the dismissal of your faithfulness as a result of our forgetfulness. Our trust is fragile, easily broken by the slightest pause, an answer to prayer not instantly given, a request for peace not immediately felt. Our trust is fragile, easily displaced by gods of our own making, the God of self-sufficiency, chased at any cost, the God of illusion, pursued in any form. Lord, have mercy on us through Christ our Lord, Amen. Beloved, hear the good news. Jesus Christ came to stand in the breach to reconcile us to God. We are forgiven and freed. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Let us pray. Almighty God, who transforms our weakness into strength, receive the prayers we long lovingly offer on behalf of the church and the world. Lord, our world is an anxious place divided by ideologies, and we grow more stubborn and disrespectful each day. Break down the barriers that exist among peoples and nations. Restore and strengthen our common life. Give to your church a bold vision and a daring love to speak and act on your behalf of your mission to restore all people and creation in peace. Comfort all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Expand our compassion, increase our faith, and make us whole as we work together for the healing of those in need. Eternal God, we remember those who are dying and those who have died. Draw them into your heavenly realm with you, Christ and the Holy Spirit, that they may dwell with you in paradise. Amen. Today, we will have the opportunity to give towards God's kingdom work being done here at FPCA. Last week, our children's ministry hosted a great event called Adventure Days, where they had a great time traveling back in time and learning about the early church from the book of Acts. They also traveled all the way back to the 1980s and learned about some of the popular language, movies, and toys during that period of time. They enjoyed snacks that were donated by church members, as well as play games and origami. It was a great week of fun, learning and reconnecting with one another. Ministries like this are possible because of our support of our general budget. Thank you for your generosity that is helping us pass down our faith from generation to generation. Truly, this glorifies God, follows Jesus, and loves our neighbor. The Lord said to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus also said to Peter, everyone to whom much is given of him much will be required. Let us bear witness to the love of God by presenting our offerings of thanksgiving.
Holy Spirit of God, shine your light upon this word and into our hearts that we may be enlightened with fresh understanding. Amen. Our first reading for today is Exodus 32, verses 1 through 4. Listen now to the word of God. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods. O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered Jesus, We are the descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the good news of our Lord. Thanks be to God. This summer, Pastor Chris is leading you in a sermon series from the book of Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah we're given a window into the lives of God's people after returning to Jerusalem from exile but returning with a conditional freedom granted to them by the leading power in the region, and really in the world at that time, Persia. We hear in Nehemiah of significant hardships and challenges they faced. Some of these were of their own making, and others from the pressures from the royal court of Persia, and then others by rival provinces competing for dominance and favor from the same Persian court and seeing the, the nascent revival of the Jewish province as a threat. These troublemaking rival provinces would repeatedly send false reports to the Persian court warning of the Jews plotting a revolt with this rebuilding of the city walls of Jerusalem. Well, that revolt did not occur under Persian rule, but actually would happen later under Greek rule after the death of Alexander the Great. But today we celebrate the 245th anniversary of what? Well, our revolution. But what happened on this day was simply the final approval of the final draft of the document we know is the Declaration of Independence. The actual declaration occurred a couple of days earlier, and then 
It would be over a month before it would be actually signed. But regardless, this is the day we celebrate as the birth of our country through revolution. Much has been accomplished during this great experiment we call the United States of America, but I think we should admit for as much that has been accomplished, there's still much wanting to be accomplished when we take a realistic look at the ideals set forth in the founding documents of our country. But you can relax. <laughs> I'm not going to preach about all the things wrong with, with our country. Frankly, I am convinced that America still holds the greatest possibilities for human flourishing that exists in the world today and, and really has ever existed. No, this morning I want to talk about us, the people of America, and by extension all of the human family, because I am convinced that is wrong with the typical American, whatever that is, is what is wrong with the world, the people of the world in general. And what I believe is wrong with Americans of all walks of life is a lack of happiness. Yes, Americans and the entire human family are struggling with a huge happiness deficit. Now you're probably looking at me like that TV character in those travel commercials called Captain Obvious. Well, while it may sound like what I'm saying is obvious, I really don't think we understand how much what is, that is wrong in each of our personal lives and what is wrong with the world in general is being driven by this basic lack of happiness. And to understand this, I believe a good starting point is the Declaration of Independence to examine this happiness problem. We don't get very far into the document before we encounter these familiar words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's that word, happiness. Now if we carefully parse these words from our Declaration of Independence, I, I believe we stumble into a lot of what we are still struggling with today in modern American society. First, we as a people are struggling with equality. We're hearing about this virtually every day. Mostly we are struggling with inequality and what causes inequality. It's not much of a stretch to say that inequality leads to unhappiness. Next, we are struggling with understanding God's role in establishing and shaping our rights as human beings in the world. As our founding leaders began to, to, to think about all the other rights besides the three, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they came up with something, James Madison drafted it, called the Bill of Rights. And the first one of those Bill of Rights contains that pesky freedom of religion that has led our society to figuratively take away the capital C in that word creator and make it a little c because we've had to accept all the varying understandings of how this all came into being, who this creator is, if it, he exists at all. This has made a lot of Christians what? Made them unhappy. Not just unhappy, but angry. And I ask you, is this the right response as Christians to get angry about this? And so I want to use this to segue in this, to this morning's message from the Declaration of Independence to God's role in all of this. The Declaration of Independence says, There are rights established and endowed by God, our Creator, that include these three, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't believe we really need to go past these three because it is in these three I believe we find the heart of our human struggle to get along with each other. And not just in America, but throughout the world. That brings us back to happiness. I think we can all agree that a life without happiness is not much of a life. Agreed? And I think we can all agree that liberty without happiness is not worth much either. Agreed? 
So I believe I can make the case with confidence that what defines the ideal of our society in the United States of America comes down to these words from our Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness. The great wisdom in that phrase, the pursuit of happiness, is that happiness is not guaranteed. Society, much less government, cannot and should not guarantee individual happiness. I believe that if we reflect on our struggle as a society, we will find that at the root of our conflicts as a society, for that matter, all conflicts in our communities, political, in the church, in our relationships, friendships, marriages, romantic or otherwise, the root cause of all these conflicts is one person's pursuit of happiness conflicting with another person's pursuit of happiness. This is because, for the most part, I believe that we all have a fairly juvenile idea of what happiness is all about. And when we pursue a flawed, distorted, and even perverted idea of happiness, conflict will always be inevitable. This I know. Our feelings of unhappiness is the place of the devil's. Satan's happiness. Because it's in our feelings of unhappiness that we are the most vulnerable to manipulation. And that, my brothers and sisters, is Satan's playground. Our distortions of what true happiness is begins at a very early age. And as I said, most of us don't appear to outgrow it. We hold on to that fairly juvenile idea of happiness well into our adulthood. And not only are our ideas about happiness formed at that early age, likewise our ideas about how to pursue happiness are formed at an early age. All this happens in our families of origin, whatever form that may take. As I reflected on this, the life of someone who was very active in, in helping young men, men of all ages actually, understand what living with integrity as Christians in the world, in their vocations, and most importantly in their family life, and of course in any role of leadership, as a promise keeper. The promise keeper's ministry was founded by James Avery along with Bill McCartney. James Avery talked about his early life and how that formed his ideas of happiness. James was the youngest of five. At a very early age, somewhere around four years old it seems, his father was arrested for armed robbery, robbery and sent to prison. His mother attempted to, to raise the five children for a while, but she couldn't, she couldn't do it. So she took the youngest three to a children's home, actually not too far from here. James was one of those three. He tells of horrific experiences in that children's home. But he also talked about the Bible lessons that were taught there and how they were used to hold over them, to, to manipulate and, and threaten punishment. The Bible was a, a means of controlling the children. So James had a very, very negative view of the Bible and the Christian faith in general. Well, James would age out of that children's home and he entered the new world with all kinds of freedoms to pursue happiness. It was the late 60s, my era. And yes, marijuana, drugs, sex without restraint were all means by which we were experimenting. People of my age, not so much me. <laughs> We're experimenting with the pursuing happiness. And following that lead, James got into a lot of trouble. He was driving on a Labor Day weekend on a long trip with a friend. He was driving. His friend was in the passenger seat. He had a wreck. His friend died. James was charged with negligent manslaughter. He was in a lot of trouble. Unhappiness. He just lost his best friend, but he was also facing serious legal consequences.
So James knew he had to get an expensive lawyer to keep him out of trouble. That's what he was advised. And so what did he do? He used his new skills acquired in pursuit of happiness to raise that money. It wasn't two months later that James was arrested for dealing drugs after that accident in which his friend died. Well, James was now facing 20 years in prison. And while James was sitting in a prison cell, jail cell over in the Dallas County Jail, a Bible verse that he had heard in that children's home came to mind. He doesn't remember it having a particular meaning to him when he first heard it in the children's home, but sitting in that jail cell, that verse entered into his, not just his mind, but his very being. From Romans 8, 28. For we know all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Well, James immediately knew that his recollection of this verse meant that his life wasn't over. That God had something more in mind for him than, than the dire future that seemed to be laying ahead for him. And so he knew that the key was turning his life over to God, to God's purpose. And so he did in that jail cell after that verse entered into his mind and into his heart. A couple of days later, James, this public defender, not an expensive attorney, came and, and told him, gave him the news, that he'd made a deal with the district attorney's office to give James a two-year sentence, basically the minimum. Well, James couldn't believe it. He was ecstatic. James entered the penitentiary system in Texas. But he did so and then immediately acquired access to Bible, to the Bible and Bible resources because he said the Holy Spirit opened the Bible up to him. He could understand it clearly. Jesus became very real to him. And with just one year of serving that two-year sentence, the state of Texas approved him for a pre-release program without him even knowing it, it could happen. And James was released. He actually came back up here to Grand Prairie, not too far from here, and began socializing with Christian groups. They were eager to hear his story and his passionate witness about how God had transformed his life during this ordeal. He continued his Bible and, and Christian studies and actually became a minister. He would be called to a church up in Boulder, Colorado, and in turn called to be the chaplain of the University of Colorado football team where he met Bill McCartney, and they launched Promise Keepers Ministry. But along the way on this journey, James reunited with his father. His father served a much, much longer prison sentence, but when they got together, James had not seen him since he was a, a little child. They talked about their prison experiences. James asked his father what unit he served his time in, and he told him, and James, James's father in turn asked James, what unit did you serve your time in? And when James told his father which unit he served in, he said his father's face just turned ashen, and his jaw dropped. He said, Dear God, James, I helped build that prison as a welder while I was serving time. Well, that statement, that, those words from his father entered James' heart as well. God not only saved him from prison, but God saved James from a prison his father built. The Holy Spirit spoke to James' heart saying, I have set you free from a prison that your father built. And that helped form James's understanding what the Promise Keepers ministry needed to be about to break the cycles. Now, it's not just the bad upbringing, even the more wholesome upbringing. I came from a loving family and I had wonderful support, but there was often happiness missing in our family life. And I know I learned my ideas about what a happy life looked like and how to pursue that happiness. And so I gave it all to my first career. Our pursuit of happiness is a prison when our idea of happiness and what we have to do to pursue happiness comes from only our life experiences, including our families of origin, no matter what form they may take. 
And I believe this makes our situation very similar to what Jesus was confronting in these verses from John's Gospel in chapter 8. The Jewish religious leaders experienced what they believed was freedom. The Roman Empire was very liberal when it came to religious practice. They encouraged their provinces to practice their religion. The more religions, the better as far as they were concerned. The more gods, the better as far as they were concerned. And these religious leaders were responding to Jesus out of that place, even though they had become to, to accept some of the things Jesus was teaching and maybe even beginning to, to think He was very, very special in some form. But Jesus knew they didn't really understand, much less believe who He truly was. And so He challenged this idea of freedom, basically telling them, you don't have any idea what real freedom is. And who can grant you that freedom? They were finding their happiness in exercising their authority under whatever freedom the Roman authorities allowed them to do. Exercising their freedom to control people's lives using the law of the Old Testament. Very similar to what James experienced in that children's home. Happiness for the scribes and Pharisees was seeing others live in strict compliance with Jewish law and regulations as they interpreted them and enforced them under whatever idea of freedom they felt they had under Roman rule. While we may have something we call liberty as Americans, few of us have true personal liberty. Most of us don't know what liberty is any more than we know what happiness is. Because most of us are enslaved by our own pursuit of happiness. Our lives are filled with behaviors designed to avoid unhappiness as well as behaviors designed to pursue a flawed and distorted idea of happiness. Most of us are so busy trying to get to a place where we can have a happy life, we've got no time or room in our lives for happiness now. Most of our ideas of happiness are distorted by what I call the curse of comparison. The curse of comparing our lives with others around us. You don't have to go very far to find unhappiness. Just spend about 30 seconds in social media. How many of us are trying to pursue happiness on social media? How many of us are carrying these devices around in our hands, constantly clicking away? In what? In pursuit of happiness. Talk about a distorted, perverted idea of happiness. We get addicted, enslaved to what social media serves us up as a means to pursue happiness. Social media accomplishes two things for us. First, it gives us this artificial, ever-changing idea about the keys to happiness and what true happiness is, as defined by an ever-changing idea of it by society. And then gives us, it gives us infinite ways to pursue and find this artificial and distorted idea of happiness. And two, social media gives us justification and reasons for our unhappiness. Not just for our unhappiness, but as justification for our anger at not being happy. If we close our eyes and conjure up an image of what happiness looks like, I believe we'll find all kinds of varying images around us. But it may bring a smile to our face. But I promise you, unless that image of happiness is the face of Jesus Christ, happiness will not just be elusive. True happiness will be unattainable. So how is the image of Jesus Christ attainable when we think about happiness? Well, Jesus Himself gave His life for this to happen in you and me. He gave us the ability to find true happiness by sacrificing His life. Jesus just doesn't give us the freedom to pursue happiness. Jesus gives us life, liberty, and happiness. 
as we move forward into John's gospel, into chapter 15. This is the night before Jesus arrest, his torture and execution, what we call the Last Supper. Jesus is teaching these words. And this is what he says. Jesus said, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. How many of us have any idea that such a thing is even possible in this life? The freedom to experience complete joy is what the Apostle Paul was talking about in his letter to the church in Galatia when he said, For freedom Christ has set us free. And again, in Jesus' own words, from our Gospel reading this morning, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. No country, no government, Nobody can give you the freedom to experience complete joy except Jesus Christ himself. This is gospel freedom. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is our Lord's table. He invites all those who believe and trust in Him to come partake of the banquet He has prepared with His very life. So as we come to the table, let us join our hearts together in prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Father, we open our hearts to You with such thanksgiving that Your love poured out upon us through the death of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave His life to give us life, who gave His life in order that we may be free to serve your purpose in our lives and in the world. And so we pray you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup. This may truly be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that by your Spirit you knit our hearts together as one in Him, so that together we may be His body in the world bringing love and hope and compassion to places of such need, close by and far away. We give you thanks that you have nourished us for this purpose and this journey. And now we lift all the prayers of our heart to you in the way our Lord Jesus taught us in singing his prayer. On the night he was to be betrayed, our Lord sat at table with his disciples, and after supper, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and also after giving thanks, he gave the cup to the disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. My sisters and brothers, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. 
Now I invite you, hopefully you prepared uh, some bread and, and the cup to participate in this Lord's Supper today, to now take the bread as the body of Christ broken for you. And the cup of the new covenant, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now let's pray. Father, we give you our thanks that today we are nourished at this table, that you love us so much that you gave your Son so that we may live. May our lives honor his life, the life he gave for us as we go out into the world renewed by the gifts of this bread and cup. May we use it to serve your holy purpose. Amen. Now may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep and guide you as you live in faith, grow in love, and abound in hope, now and forevermore. Amen.